Cough and shortness of breath are common symptoms for which persons seek medical care. The following true story describes a patient in whom these common symptoms were ultimately found to have an uncommon cause. A 35-year-old man presented to a Veterans Affairs pulmonary clinic with a four-year history of progressive shortness of breath, cough, and burning retrosternal chest pain with exertion. His symptoms never occurred at rest and were most pronounced while he was running. He was previously evaluated at another clinic and was diagnosed with asthma. He was prescribed inhaled albuterol to use before exercise, but noted that his symptoms continued to worsen despite treatment. Asthma may develop at any age and is characterized by respiratory symptoms that often worsen with triggers such as cold weather, viral pathogens, exercise, or allergens. The presence of reversible airflow obstruction is a key factor in differentiating asthma from other causes of dyspnea. This patient's lack of improvement with albuterol and the slowly progressive nature of his symptoms are atypical for asthma. This patient had a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease, chronic rhinitis, obstructive sleep apnea, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obesity. He reported gaining 13 kilograms in the four years since the onset of his symptoms. He denied a childhood history of asthma or seasonal allergies. He used nightly continuous positive airway pressure. His medications included inhaled albuterol as needed, fluticasone nasal spray, and pentoprazole. These therapies did not improve his cough. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, rhinitis, and asthma are all common causes of chronic cough. However, the lack of improvement in his cough with medications for these conditions suggests that an alternative cause of his symptoms should be considered. The patient had smoked one pack of cigarettes per day from age 16 until three years prior to his presentation. He used cannabidiol oil but did not smoke marijuana. He had vaped on one occasion three years earlier. He had a history of excessive alcohol consumption but denied any recent alcohol use. There was no family history of heart or lung disease. He was a U.S. Marine Corps veteran and after discharge from the military, worked as a janitor and automobile mechanic before taking a medical leave of absence. This exposure history brings up several other potential etiologies of his symptoms. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a genetic condition that can cause early-onset chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Smoking can accelerate this process. However, this patient has no family history of lung disease. His occupational exposures from cleaning products could point to an irritant-induced asthma, but his symptoms had persisted despite taking a medical leave of absence. Finally, vaping has been linked to acute lung injury, but his symptoms predated his vaping exposure. The patient appeared well and did not appear short of breath at rest. His respiratory rate was 18 breaths per minute, pulse was 82 beats per minute, blood pressure 132 over 75 millimeters of mercury, and his oxygen saturation was 97% while breathing ambient air. His body mass index was 33. His breath sounds were normal in both lungs, heart sounds were regular, and there was no peripheral edema. He had mild erythema of his nasal mucosa. Muscle strength was five out of five in the arms and legs. His complete blood count and IgE levels were normal. Electrocardiogram was normal. His physical exam is reassuring, with no obvious evidence of a neuromuscular or cardiac disorder. Laboratory testing does not reveal anemia or an allergic phenotype. At this point, further testing should be performed. Pulmonary function testing showed adequate effort with narrowed inspiratory and expiratory flow volume loops, but no findings suggestive of small airway obstruction. His forced expiratory volume in one second, FEV1, total lung capacity, forced vital capacity, and residual volume were low. His FEV1 to force vital capacity, FVC ratio, was 0.8. Use of a bronchodilator did not result in any clinically significant improvement in FEV1 or FVC. A methacholine challenge did not induce a 20% decrease in FEV1 from the baseline value. The chest radiograph was normal. The lack of improvement with bronchodilator and lack of bronchoconstriction after methacholine challenge rule out asthma. 
His testing showed a low FEV1 combined with a low FVC. This is consistent with restrictive lung disease, which can result from parenchymal or chest wall pathology. This patient has obesity, which can cause restriction of the chest wall and lungs through mechanical compression. More lung imaging is needed. A computed tomography scan of the chest showed mild air trapping without evidence of interstitial lung disease. Air trapping happens when gas does not escape the alveolar lung units with forced expiration. In isolation, it can suggest small airway disease such as asthma, chronic bronchitis, or bronchiolitis. Further testing can help elucidate the cause. Testing for antinuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor, anticyclic citrullinated peptide antibodies, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency was negative. Repeat pulmonary function testing again showed a restrictive ventilatory defect. The diffusing capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide, which had not been measured previously owing to the patient's cough, indicated a mild impairment in gas exchange. Testing with a forced oscillation technique, which measures the mechanical properties of the respiratory system, was consistent with decreased airway caliber and decreased lung compliance. The patient underwent cardiopulmonary exercise testing, but this was terminated after four minutes due to severe dyspnea. His peak oxygen consumption was 33% of the predicted value, and he had exerted 3.6 metabolic equivalents, much lower than predicted. His peak heart rate reached 123 beats per minute, which was only two-thirds of the predicted value. There was no clinically significant change in the FEV1 after exercise and no marked decrease in the oxygen saturation. Testing also demonstrates inefficient ventilation and reduced ventilatory reserve. These findings suggested respiratory limitation to exercise. However, the absence of decline in FEV1 with exercise further argues against asthma. This patient's findings are more suggestive of an abnormality in the small airways, which can be difficult to detect with routine testing. While the patient's obesity and deconditioning can cause a restrictive ventilatory defect, blunted heart response, and impaired exercise tolerance, they would not explain findings suggestive of small airway disease. The more likely explanation is that his small airway defect caused his subsequent dyspnea and weight gain. A lung biopsy is indicated to establish this diagnosis or identify other conditions. The patient underwent a video-assisted thoracoscopic lung biopsy. Analysis of specimens from each lobe of the lung showed pathologic changes consistent with constrictive bronchiolitis. Constrictive bronchiolitis can occur in a variety of settings, including in patients who have undergone organ transplantation, those with autoimmune disease, or those who have had respiratory infections. This patient's history of military service may have resulted in exposures that led to the development of constrictive bronchiolitis. The patient had been deployed twice during Operation Iraqi Freedom 13 years prior to presentation. During deployment, he routinely discarded paper, electronics, used medical supplies, tires, and food into an open burn pit. He was also involved in burning human waste by using jet propellant and stirring it in 50-gallon drums. He had not used any personal protective equipment and recalled that he developed a cough and phlegm production after being exposed to fumes from the burn pit. This occupational history is critical to making the diagnosis. Active and former military personnel, especially those deployed in the post-September 11th era, have unique exposures such as sand and dust storms, burn pit fumes, and sulfur dioxide from sulfur mine fires. Deployed military personnel who have had exposures to hazardous substances can have near-normal results on physiological testing, but a range of histopathological abnormalities. These range from granulomatous pneumonitis and pleural inflammation to constrictive or other forms of chronic bronchiolitis. This patient was diagnosed with constrictive bronchiolitis related to deployment. Based on limited evidence showing benefit in other small airway diseases, the patient was prescribed inhaled budesonide and formoterol, as well as azithromycin to take three times weekly. In addition to the prescribed medications, pulmonary rehabilitation was recommended. At two-year follow-up, he reported that his cough and dyspnea had abated. Caring for returning veterans involves considering the many potential health effects of deployment. 
It was only after obtaining more information about the patient's military service history and documenting findings that were inconsistent with asthma that he was correctly diagnosed with constricted bronchiolitis. The patient fortunately improved following treatment. However, some patients with burn pit-associated respiratory problems may continue to experience chronic symptoms despite treatment. This case underscores the importance of taking a thorough history, especially for patients who have unique occupational exposures.